Section 13 of The American Rivals of Sherlock Holmes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary in Arkansas. The American Rivals of Sherlock Holmes. Section 13. The Cloudbursters by Francis Lind. Part 1. It was an article in the news columns of the Brewster Morning Tribune which first called the attention of the Brewsterites and the Intermountain world in general to the plans and purposes of the Mesquite Valley Land and Irrigation Company. Conabel, a hard-working reporter on the Tribune, had been sent over to Angels, the old headquarters of the Red Butte Western on the other side of the Timonianus, to get the story of three shooting affray which had localized itself in Pete Grimm's place, the one remaining angelic saloon. Finding the barroom battle of little worth as a news story, and having time to kill between trains, Conabal had strolled up the gulch beyond the old copper mines, and had stumbled upon the construction camp of the Mesquite Company. Being short of copy on the fight story, the reporter had written up the irrigation project, taking the general outlines from a foreman on the job, whose tongue he loosened with a handful of Brewster cigars. A big earth dam was in process of construction across the mouth of the rather precipitous valley of Mesquite Creek, and the mesa below, which to Conable's on rural eye seemed to be a very Sahara of infertile desolation, was to be made to blossom like the rose. Kendall, managing editor of the Tribune, had run the story, partly because real news happened to be scarce at the moment, and partly out of sheer astonishment that an enterprise of the magnitude of the Mesquite Project had not already flooded the country with the brass band publicity literature which is supposed to attract investors. That a land and irrigation company should actually wait until its dam was three-fourths completed before it began to advertise was a thing sufficiently curious to call for editorial comment. Why editor Kendall did not comment on the news item as a matter of singular interest is a query which had its answer on the loggia porch of the Hotel Topaz in the evening of the day on which Conable's write-up appeared. It was Kendall's regular habit to close his desk at seven o'clock and to spend a leisurely hour over his dinner at the Topaz before settling down to his night's work. On the evening in question he had chanced to sit at table with Maxwell, the general superintendent of the railroad, and with Maxwell's friend and college classmate, Sprague. After dinner the three had gone out to the loggia porch to smoke, and it was the big chemistry expert who spoke of the Mesquite news story which had appeared that morning in the Tribune. Yes, said the editor. Conable got on to that yesterday. I sent him over to Angel to write up a shooting scrape, and he had more time on his hands than he knew what to do with. We've all known, in a general way, that an eastern company was doing something over there, but I had no idea that they'd got their dam pretty nearly done and were about ready to open up for business. It's wildcat, pure and unadulterated, cut in the railroad man snappily. What they are going to do to a lot of woolly investors will be good and plenty. That mesquite mesa land is just about as fertile as this street pavement here. Kendall was a dried-up little wisp of a man, with tired eyes and a face the color of old oak-tanned leather. That is what you would think, that they are out there for the easy money, he agreed, but there's something a little queer about it. They haven't advertised. Not here, supplemented Maxwell. It would be a trifle too rank. Everybody in the Timignani knows what that land is over in the edge of the Red Desert. They haven't advertised anywhere, so far as I can ascertain, put in the editor quietly. What is more, Jennings, who is the engineer in charge of the dam building, and who seems to be the only man in authority on the ground, came in this afternoon and raised sand with me for printing the news story. He said they were not exploiting the scheme here at all, that their money and their investors were all in the East, and they were asking no odds of the Brewster newspapers. Bitter sort of devil, that fellow Jennings, was Maxwell's comment. But it was the big chemist who followed the main thread of the argument. What reason did he give for making such an extraordinary break as that, Mr. Kendall? Oh, he had his reason, Pat enough, rejoined the editor with his tired smile. He said he realized that we have irrigated land of our own over here in the park, upon which we are anxious to get settlers, and that public sentiment there would naturally be against the Mesquite project. 
he asks as a matter of fairness that we simply let the desert project alone he claimed that it had been financed without taking a dollar out of the tomagnani so we could not argue that there were local investors to be protected uh, that argument cuts both ways it's an admission that the eastern investors might need protection scoffed the railroad superintendent then he added they certainly will if they expect to get any money back that they have been spending in mesquite valley why kendall mesquite creek is bone dry half the year and the other half inquired sprague it's a cloudburst proposition like a good many of the foothills arroyos maxwell explained once in a summer storm i saw a wall of water ten feet high come down that stream bed tumbling twenty dun boulders in the thick of it as if they'd been brook pebbles then for a month maybe it would be merely a streak of dry sand perhaps they are counting up on storing the cloudburst water commented kendall dryly then as he rose to go back to his work as you say maxwell it has all the earmarks of the wildcat but so long as it doesn't stick its claws out at us i suppose we haven't much excuse for butting in good night gentlemen drop in on me when you're up my way always glad to see you the two who remained on the hotel porch after the editor went away smoked in comradely silence for a time the night was enchantingly fine with a first quarter moon swinging low in a vault of velvety blackness and a gentle breeze fragrant with the breath of the mountain forest creeping down upon the city from the backgrounding highlands across the plaza and somewhere in the yards behind the long two-storied railroad headquarters building and station a night crew was making up trains and the clank and crash of coupling cars mingled with the rapid-fire exhaust of the switching engine the big-bodied chemical expert was the first to break the companionable silence, asking a question which had reference to the epidemic of disaster and demoralization which had recently swept over Maxwell's railroad. Well, how are things coming by this time, Dick? Are the men responding fairly well to that little circular letter, man-to-man -man appeal we concocted? They are, for a fact, was the hearty assurance. I've never seen anything like it in railroading in all my knocking about. They've been coming in squads to fess up and take the pledge, and to assure me it's the water wagon for theirs from now on. By George Calvin, it's the most mellowing experience I've ever had. It proves what you have always said, and what I've always wanted to believe, that the good in the mass definitely outweighs the bad, and that it will come to the front if only you know how to appeal to it. That's right, averred the chemist. It is the strong hope of the country that there is justice and fairness and sane common sense at the American bottom of us, if they can only get at it. I think you can call the booze fight and demoralization roundup a trouble past, and begin to look around you for the signs and symptoms of the next biff you're going to get. The stockily built little man, who stood as the railroad company's chief field officer in the far western fighting line, moved uneasily in his chair. I have been hoping that there wasn't going to be any next time, he said, chewing thoughtfully upon his cigar. I should hope with you, Dick, if we had been able, in any of the former scrimmages, to secure good, indubitable court evidence against the men who were backing those buccaneering raids on your securities. The one thing that big money fears today is the law. The law as the federal courts are likely to construe and administer it. But to obtain your day in court, you've got to have evidence and thus far we haven't been able to sweat out anything that would implicate the man or men higher up. Therefore you may continue to sleep on your arms, keeping a sharp eye out for surprises. I guess that is pretty good advice, was the ready admission, but it is rather difficult to put into practice, Calvin. There are five hundred miles of this railroad, and my job of operating them is big enough to keep me busy without doing any detective stunts on the side. I know, Sprague nodded reflectively, and for that reason I've been halfway keeping an eye out for you myself. You have? Don't tell me you've been finding more grief. Sprague threw away his outburned stub, and found and lighted a fresh cigar. I don't want to pose as an alarmist, he offered at length, but I'd like to dig a little deeper into this mesquite irrigation scheme. How much or little do you know about it? Next to nothing. About two months ago, Jennings, the construction engineer, made application for the through handling from COPA of a trainload of machinery, tools, and camp outfit. 
He has to have the stuff delivered at the end of the old copper mine spur above Angel's. We put the spur in shape for him and delivered the freight. Well, what else? That is about all we have had to do with him in a business way. Two weeks ago, when we had that wreck at Lobo, they were asking Benson for an extension of the copper mine spur to a point nearer their job, chiefly, I think, so they could run a handcar back and forth between the camp and the saloon at Angel's. Benson didn't recommend it, and the matter was dropped. Without protest? Oh, yes. Jenny's didn't make much of a roar. In fact, I've always felt that he avoided me when he could. He's in town a good bit, but I rarely see him. Somebody told me he tried once to get into the town and country club, but didn't make it. I don't know who would blackball him or why, but evidently someone did. The ash grew a full half-inch longer on Sprague's fresh cigar before he said, Doesn't it occur to you that there is something a bit mysterious about this dry land irrigation scheme, Dick? I had never thought of it as being mysterious. It is a palpable swindle, of course, but swindles are like the poor. They're always with us. It interests me, said the big man, half musingly. A company formed nobody knows where or how drops down in the edge of the red desert and begins, absolutely without any of the clatter and clamor of advertising that usually goes with such enterprises, to build what, from all reports, must be a pretty costly dam. If they have acquired a title to the Mesquite Mesa, no one seems to have heard of it, and if they are hoping to sell the land when the dam is completed, that too has been kept dark. Now comes this little newspaper puff this morning, and Mr. Jennings promptly turns up to ask Kendall to drop it. It is rather queer when you come to put the odds and ends of it together, admitted the railroad man. Decidedly queer, I should say. So far the government man went on the line which he himself had opened. Then he switched abruptly. By the way, where is your brother-in-law, Starbuck? I haven't seen him for three or four days. Billy has been in Red Butte, figuring on a little mining deal in which we are both interested, but I'm looking for him back to-night. Good. If you should happen to see him when the train comes in, ask him to come over here and smoke a pipe with me. Tell him I'm losing my carefully acquired cowboy accent, and I'd like to freshen it up a bit. The superintendent promised, and since he always had work to do, went across to his office in the second story of the combined headquarters and station building. Some hour or so later, the evening train came in from the west, and at the outpouring of passengers from it, one, a man whose air of prosperous independence was less in the grave, young old face and the loosely fitting khaki service clothes than in the way in which he carried his shoulders, was met by a boy from the superintendent's office, and the word passed sent him diagonally across the grass-covered plaza to swing himself lightly over the railing of the hotel porch. "'Dick made a motion as if you wanted to smoke a peace-pipe with me,' he said, dropping carelessly into the chair which had been Maxwell's. "'Yes,' Sprague assented, and then he went on to explain why. At the end of the explanation, Starbuck nodded. "'I reckon we can do it all right. Go up on the early morning train to the canyon head and take a chance on picking up a couple of broncs at Wimberley's ranch. But we could hoof it over from Angel's in less than a quarter of the time it'll take us to ride up the river from Wimberley's.' For reasons of my own, Billy, I don't want to hoof it, as you say, from angels. To mention one of them, I might ask you to remember that I tipped the scale at a little over the half of the third hundred just now, and I'm pretty heavy on my feet. And therewith the matter rested. At an early hour the following morning, an hour when the sun was just swinging clear over the far distant blue horizon line of the crosswater hills, which marks the eastern limit of the great desert, Two men dropped from the halted eastbound train at the Timignani Canyon water tank and made their way round the nearest of the hogbacks to the ranch house of one William Wimberley. As Starbuck had predicted, two horses were obtainable, though the ranchman looked long and dubiously at the big figure of the government chemist before he was willing to risk even the heaviest of the horses in his small remuda. "'I reckon you'll have to sit sort of light on the saddle, mister,' he said at the mounting, and then, apparently as an afterthought, "'By gollies, I wouldn't have you fall over against me for a farm in God's country, stranger. If you was to live around here, we'd call you Samson, and take up an ejection for the poor suffering Philistines. We sure would.' Sprague laughed good-naturedly as he followed Starbuck's lead toward the river. 
he was well used to being joked about his size and there were times when he rather encouraged the joke big men are popularly supposed to be more or less helpless physically and sprague was enough of a humorist to enjoy the upsetting now and then of the popular tradition in his college days he had held the record for the heavy lift and the broad jump there was no man of his class who could stand up to him with the gloves or on the wrestling mat and in the football field he was at once the strongest back and the fastest man on the team a combination rare enough to be miraculous you say you want to follow the river said starbuck when they had struck in between the precipitous hills among which the green flood of the timignani made its way toward the canyon portal yes if it is at all practicable i'd like to get some idea of the lay of the land between this and the camp on the mesquite i'm anticipating that you'll get the idea good and plenty agreed the superintendent's brother-in-law dryly and during the three-hour jaunt that followed the prediction was amply confirmed there was no trail and for the greater part of the way the river flowed between rocky hogbacks with only the narrowest boulder-strewn margins on either hand time and again they were forced to dismount and lead the horses around or over the natural obstructions and once they were obliged to leave the river valley entirely climbing and descending again by a circuitous route among the rugged hills it was late in the forenoon when they came finally into the region of upper basins and turning to the eastward threaded a dry arroyo which brought them out upon the level bottom valley known as the mesquite mesa it was not a mesa in the proper meaning of the term it was rather a vast flat wash brought down from the hills by the sluicing of many floods here and there its sun-baked surface was cut and gashed by dry gullies all pointing towards the river and each bearing silent witness to the manner in which the mesa had been formed at a point well within this shut-in moraine sprague dismounted tossed his bridle reins to starbuck and went to examine the soil in the various gullies each dry ditch afforded a perfect cross-section of the different strata, from the thin layer of sandy topsoil to the underlying beds of coarse sandstone pebbles and gravel. Sprague kicked the edges from a dozen of the little ditches, secured a few handfuls of the soil, and came back shaking his head. "'I don't wonder that these people don't want to advertise their land, Billy,' he commented, climbing with a nimbleness astonishing in so large a man to the back of his mount." as they say down in tennessee you couldn't raise a fuss on it let's amble along and see what they are doing at the headworks at the head of the wash the valley of mesquite creek came in abruptly from the right on a bench above the mouth of the valley they found the construction camp of the irrigation company a scattered collection of shack sheds and tents a corral for the working stock and the usual filth and litter characterizing the temporary home of the wop across the valley mouth a huge earthwork was rising it was the simplest form of construction known to the dam building engineer a mere heaping of earth and gravel mounted by two horse scrapers from the slopes of the contiguous hills on either hand there was no masonry no concrete not even the thin core wall which modern engineering practice prescribes for the strengthening member in an earth embankment designed to retain any considerable body of water moreover there was no spillway the creek carrying at this season of the year its minimum flow had been stopped off without an outlet and the embankment upon which the force was heaping the scrapings from the hillsides was already retaining a good-sized lake formed by the checked waters of the stream starbuck and sprague had drawn rein at the outskirts of the construction camp and they were not molested until sprague took a flat black box from his pocket opened it into a camera and was preparing to take a snapshot of the dam at that a man who had been lounging in the door of the camp commissary a dark-faced black-bearded giant in brown duck and service leggings crossed the camp street and threw up a hand in warning hey there hold on that don't go he shouted gruffly striding up to stand squarely in the way of the camera you can't take pictures on this job sorry said sprague giving the intruder his most amiable smile but you were just a half second too late and he closed the camera into its box-like shape and dropped it into his pocket the black-bearded man advanced threateningly this is company property and you are trespassers he rasped give me that camera starbuck's right hand went softly under his coat and stayed there and his steady gray eyes took on the sleepy look that in his range-riding day had been a sufficient warning to those who knew him 
Sprague lounged easily in his saddle, and ignored the hand extended for the camera. "'You are Mr. Jennings, I take it,' he said as one who would temporize and gain time. "'Fine dam you were building here. "'Give me that camera!' Sprague met the angry eyes of the engineer and smiled back into them. "'I'll take it under consideration,' he said half-jocularly. "'You'll give me a little time to think about it, won't you?' Jennings' hand dropped to the butt of the heavy revolver sagging at his hip. "'Not a damn minute!' he barked. "'Hand it over!' Starbuck was closing up slowly on the opposite side of his companion's horse, a movement which he brought about by a steady knee pressure on the bronco's off shoulder. Jennings' fingers were closing round the grip of his pistol when the astounding thing happened. Without so much as a muscle twitching of warning, Sprague's left hand shot out, the fingers grappled an ample breast-hold on the engineer's coat and shirt-bosom, and Jennings was snapped from his feet and flung, back down, across the horn of Sprague's saddle, much as if his big body had been a bag of meal. Starbuck reached over, jerked the engineer's weapon from its holster, broke it to eject the cartridges, and flung it away. "'Now you can get down,' said Sprague quietly. And when he loosened the terrible clutch, Jennings slid from the saddle-horn and fell, cursing like a maniac." "'Stand still,' ordered Starbuck, when the engineer bounded to his feet and started to run toward the commissary, and the weapon that made the bidding mandatory materialized suddenly from an inner pocket of the ex-cowman's khaki riding coat. But the trouble, it seemed, was just fairly getting under way. Up from the embankment where the scrapers were dumping came two or three foremen armed with pick-handles. The commissary was turning out its quota of rough-looking clerks and timekeepers, and a mob of foreign laborers— the shift off duty, came pouring out of the bunkhouses and shacks. Sprague had unlimbered and focused his camera again, and was calmly taking snapshot after snapshot of the dam, of the impounded lake, of the upcoming mob, and of the black-bearded man held hands up in the middle of the camp street. When he shut the box on the last of the exposures, he turned to Starbuck with a whimsical smile wrinkling at the corners of his eyes. "'They don't seem to be very enthusiastic about keeping us here, Billy.' he said with gentle irony. Shall we go? Starbuck shook the reins over the neck of his mount, and the two horses wheeled as one, and sprang away down the rough cart road, leading to the end of the copper mine spur above Angel's. At the retreat, someone on the commissary porch began to pump a repeating rifle in the general direction of the pair, but no harm was done. Starbuck was the first to break the galloping silence when an intervening hill shoulder had cut off the backward view of the camp at the dam, and what he said was purely complimentary. "'You sure have got your nerve with you, and the punch to back it up,' he chuckled. "'I reckon I'm going to wake up in the middle of the night, laughing at the way you snatched that rustler out of his tracks and slammed him across the saddle. I'd give a heap to be able to do a thing like that. I sure would.' "'Call it an act,' rejoined Sprague modestly. You pick up a good many of those little tricks when you're training on the squad. Perhaps you've never thought of it, but the human body is easier to handle, weight for weight, than any inanimate object could possibly be. That is one of the first things you learn in tackling on the football field. They were jogging along slowly by this time, and had passed the copper mine switch on the road leading to the station at Angel's. Starbuck was not over-curious, but the experiences of the forenoon were a little puzzling. Why had his companion wished to take the long, hard ride up the valley of the Temignane? And why, again, had he taken the chance of a fight for the sake of securing a few snapshot pictures of the irrigation company's construction camp and dam? A third query hinged itself upon the decidedly inhospitable, not to say hostile, attitude of Jennings, the irrigation company's field officer. Why should he object so strenuously to the common sightseer's habit of kodaking anything and everything in sight? Starbuck was turning these things over in his mind when they reached Angel's. As they rode into town, Sprague glanced at his watch. I've been wondering if we couldn't get this man Dickory at the town corral to take charge of these horses of ours until Wimberley can come and get them, he said. That would make it possible for us to catch the 11.30 train for Brewster. Starbuck said it was quite feasible and by the time they had disposed of the horses, the train was whistling for the station. When they boarded the train, Sprague proposed that they postpone the midday meal in the diner in order to ride out on the rear platform of the observation car. "'We'll get to town in time for a late luncheon at the hotel,' was the way he put it, 
and on as fine a day as this I like to ride out of doors and take in the scenery. Starbuck acquiesced and smiled as one well used to the scenery. Truly the trip through the Timignani Canyon was one which usually brought the tourists crowding to the rear platform of the train, but until the morning of this purely sightseeing jaunt he had been thinking that Maxwell's big friend was altogether superior to the scenic attractions. Now, however, Sprague seemed greatly interested in the canyon passage. Again and again he called his companion's attention to the engineering difficulties which had been overcome in building the narrow pathway for the rails through the great gorge. Particularly he dwelt on the stupendous cost of making the pathway and upon the temerarious courage of the engineers in adopting a grade so near, in dozens of places, to the level of the foaming torrent at the track side. Yes, Starbuck agreed, it sure did cost a heap of money. Dick says the thirty-six miles are bonded at one hundred thousand dollars a mile, and even that didn't cover the cost of construction on some of the miles. But why did they put the grade so close to the river level? persisted the expert, when the foam from a midstream boulder breathed a misty breath on them as the train slid past. Isn't there constant trouble from high water? No, Tim and Yanni's a tolerably dependable creek, was Starbuck's answer. Summer and winter it holds its own, with nothing like the variation you find in the Mississippi Valley rivers. An eight-foot rise is the biggest they've ever recorded at the High Line Dam, so J. Montague Smith tells me. They are fixed to take care of that much of a rise at the High Line Dam, are they? queried Sprague. Oh, yes. I reckon they could take a bigger one than that if they had to. That dam is built for keeps. Williams, who was a constructing engineer, says that the dam and plant will stand when the water of the river is pouring through the second-story windows of the powerhouse. And that, you would say, would never happen, put in the expert thoughtfully, adding, if it should happen, your brother-in-law would have to build him a new railroad through this canyon, wouldn't he? He sure would. The eight-foot rise I spoke of gave them a heap of trouble up here. Washouts to burn. What caused that rise? Rains? rains and cloudbursts in the season of the melting snows. It was just as Smith was turning heaven and earth upside down to get the dam completed, and for a little spell they sure was anticipating trouble aplenty. Thought they were going to be plumb paralyzed. I want to meet that man Smith, said the expert, going off at a tangent as his habit was. Stillings, your friend the lawyer who has his offices next door to my laboratory, says he's a wonder. Smith is all right with Starbuck's verdict. He's a first-class fighting man, and he doesn't much care who knows it. He got big rich out of that high-line fight, married old Colonel Baldwin's little peach of a daughter, and is laying off to live happily ever after. From that on, the rear platform talk had to do chiefly with Mr. J. Montague Smith and his plucky struggle with the hydroelectric trust, which he had tried, unsuccessfully as the event proved, to steal the high-line dam and water privilege. In due time the train shot out of the gorge, and after a dodging course among the park hills came to the skirting of the High Line Reservoir Lake, lying like a silver mirror in its setting of forested buttes and spurs. At the lower end of the lake, where the white concrete dam stretched its massive rampart across the river gorge, the train halted for a moment in obedience to an interposing block signal. It was during the momentary stop that a handsome young fellow with a healthy tan of the hill country browning his frank boyish face came out of the nearby powerhouse, ran up the embankment, and swung himself over the railing of the observation platform. "'Hello, John,' said Starbuck, and then he introduced the newcomer to his companion. "'Glad to know you, Mr. Sprague,' said the young man, whose hearty hand-grip was an instant recommendation to the good graces of the big expert." I've been hearing of you off and on all summer. It's the same with us out here that any friend of Dick Maxwell's owns Brewster, or as much of it as he cares to make use of. I've certainly been finding it that way, Mr. Smith, Sprague rejoined, in grateful recognition of the Brewster hospitality. And then, we were just talking about you and your dam as we came along, Starbuck and I. You have a pretty good head of water on, haven't you? An unusually good head for this time of year. The heavy storms we've been having in the eastern foothills account for it. Our power plant is working at normal load, and our ranchmen are all using water liberally, and they're late irrigating it. And yet you see the quantity that is going over the splashboards. Yes, I see, observed Sprague thoughtfully. And when the train began to move onward, with this big reservoir behind you, 
I suppose a sudden flood couldn't hurt you, Mr. Smith? The young man with a healthy tan on his clean-cut face promptly showed his good business sense. We think we have a comfortably safe installation, but we are not specially anxious to try it out merely for the satisfaction of seeing how much it would stand, was the conservative reply. Sprague looked up curiously from his solid planting in the biggest of the platform folding chairs. And yet three days ago, Mr. Smith, you said in the presence of witnesses that a ten-foot rise wouldn't endanger your dam or your power plant, he put in shrewdly. Mr. J. Montague Smith, secretary and treasurer of the Timignani High Line Company, was plainly taken unawares. How the depth he began, and then he tried again. Pardon me, Mr. Sprague. You hit me when I wasn't looking for it. I believe I did say something like that. In fact, I've said similar things a good many times. But not in exact feet and inches, I hope, said Sprague with a show of mild concern. These exactnesses are what murder us, Mr. Smith. Now, I presume if somebody should come to you today and threaten to turn another ten feet of river on you, you'd object, wouldn't you? We certainly would object most strenuously. Yet, if that person were so minded, he might quote you as having said that ten additional feet wouldn't hurt you. The young treasurer laughed a trifle uneasily. I can't believe that anybody would make a bit of well-meant boasting like that an excuse for. But it's not altogether absurd, you know. Your case is unsupposable. Suppose nobody pushes the button for the rains or the cloudburst storms. When you introduce me to the fellow who really has the making of the weather in the Timignani headwaters, I'll be very careful what I say to him. Just so, said the expert quietly and then a long-continued blast of the locomotive whistle announced the approach to Brewster. Sprague took leave of his latest acquaintance at the station entrance, where a trim, high-powered motor-car, driven by an exceedingly pretty young woman in leather cap, gauntlets, and driving coat, was waiting for Smith. "'I am a soil expert, as you may have heard, Mr. Smith,' he said at parting, "'and I am interested, at the moment, in alluvial washes, the detritus brought down from the high lands by the rivers.' One of these days I may call upon you for a little information and help. Command me, said the young financier, with another of the hearty hand grips, and then he climbed in beside the pretty young woman and was driven away. Sprague was unusually silent during the tardy luncheon shared with Starbuck in the Topaz Café, and Starbuck, who never had much to say unless he was pointedly invited, was correspondingly speechless. Afterward, with a word of caution to his stable companion, not to mention the morning's adventure to any one, Sprague went to his laboratory to test the specimens of soil gathered on the mesquite mesa, Starbucks supposed. But the supposition was wrong. What Mr. Calvin Sprague busied himself with during the afternoon was the careful developing of the film taken from his pocket camera and the printing of several sets of pictures therefrom. These prints he placed in his pocket notebook, and the book and its enclosures went with him when, after the evening meal, at which he had somehow missed both Maxwell and Starbuck, he climbed the three flights of stairs in the Tribune building and presented himself at the door of editor Kindle's den. Kindle was glad to see him, or at least he said he was, and, waving him to a chair at the desk end, produced a box of rather dubious-looking, curiously twisted cigars, at which the visitor shook his head despondently. You'd say I was the picture of health, wouldn't you, Kendall? And you wouldn't believe me if I were to tell you that I'm smoking a great deal too much, he said with a quizzical smile that was on the verge of turning into a grin. The editor was not fooled. As a matter of fact, it was an exceedingly difficult matter to fool the tired-eyed tyrant of the Tribune editorial rooms. Cut it out, he said with his mirthless laugh. You wouldn't expect to find fifty-cent reinas in a newspaper shop any more than I'd expect you to climb up here with a news story for me. Smoke your own cigars and be damned to you. And in sheer defiance he lighted one of his own dubious monstrosities, while Sprague was chuckling and passing his pocket case of fat black maduros. You say any more than you'd expect a news story. Perhaps I have a news story for you. Cast your eyes over these. And he threw out the bunch of lately made photographs. The editor went over the collection carefully, and at the end of the inspection said, Well, what's the answer? 
The construction camp of the Mesquite Land and Irrigation Company at about half past ten this forenoon. The held up man is Mr. Engineer Jennings, posed by Billy Starbuck, who is kindly holding the gun on him for me. The people running are Jennings' workmen, coming to help him obliterate us. The water is the irrigation lake, the heap of dirt is the dam. Still, I don't quite grasp the news value, said Kendall doubtfully. Why should Jennings wish to obliterate you? because I was taking pictures on his job. He was unreasonable enough to demand my camera and to make the sham bad man's break of handling his gun without pulling it on me. The editor studied the pictures long and thoughtfully. You've got something up your sleeve, Mr. Sprague. What is it? he asked after the considering pause. Sprague drew his chair closer, and for five minutes the city editor, who had come in for a word with his superior, forbore to break in upon the low-toned earnest confidence which was going on at the managing editor's desk at the end of it however he heard kindle say i'll get monty smith on the wire and if he coincides with you we'll take a hand in this i more than half believe you're right but you'll admit that it sounds rather incredible the tribune's motto is all the news that is news but we don't want to be classed among the yellows you run no risk in the present instance, was Spray's confident assurance. Of course there is no direct evidence. If there were, the case would be promptly taken to the courts. As a matter of fact, I am hoping that Mr. Smith will take it to the courts as it stands. But, in any event, an appeal to the public will do no harm. All right, we'll see what Smith says, said Kendall. And then the patient city editor had his inning. Leaving the Tribune building, the chemistry expert went to the nearest telephone and called for the house number of Mr. Robert Stillings, the attorney who served locally for the railroad company and was also counsel for the High Line people. Happily, it was the young lawyer himself who answered the phone. "'This is Sprague,' said the downtown caller. "'How busy are you this evening?' The answer was apparently satisfactory, since the big man went on. "'All right.' I wish you would arrange to meet me in the lobby of the topaz. Catch the next car if it won't hurry you too much. You'll do it? Thank you. Goodbye. Fifteen minutes later, the government man, writing a letter at one of the desks at the hotel lobby, looked up to greet his summoned visitor, a keen-eyed, self-confident young man, whose reputation as a fearless fighter and just causes was already spreading from the little inner mountain city of his adoption and becoming statewide. I'm here, said Stillings briefly, and Sprague rose and drew him aside into one of the alcoves. For some little time after they had drawn their chairs together, Sprague held the floor, talking earnestly and exhibiting a set of the snapshot pictures. Stillings listened attentively, examining the pictures by the aid of a small pocket magnifier. But when Sprague finished, he was shaking his head doubtfully, unconsciously following the example set by the Tribune editor. We have nothing definite to go on, Mr. Sprague, as you yourself admit. These people are well within their legal rights. As you probably know, there is no statutory provision in this state requiring the builders of a dam to conform to any particular plan of construction. And, as a matter of fact, there are dozens of dams just like this one, mere earth embankments without masonry of any kind. Do you mean to say that the safety of the entire Timignani Valley could be endangered by a structure like this, and that the property owners who were imperiled have no legal recourse demanded the expert recourse yes plenty of it after the fact if the dam should give way and cause damage the irrigation company would be liable humph <laughs> snorted the big-bodied one half contemptuously law is one of the few things that i've never dabbled in what you say amounts to this if i find a man training a cannon on my house i have no right to stop him I can only try to collect damages after the gun has gone off and ripped a hole through my property. I could make a better law than that myself. Stillings was staring thoughtfully through the opposite window at the lights in the railroad buildings across the plaza. There are times, Mr. Sprague, when we all feel that way. Crises which seem to call for something in the way of extrajudicial proceedings, he admitted. And then, have you told Maxwell about this? Not specifically. Dick has troubles of his own just now. He's had enough of them this summer to turn his hair gray, as you know. I have been hoping that this latest move of the enemy could be blocked without dragging him into it. 
Stillings turned quickly. That is the frankest thing you've said this evening. Is it another move of the enemy, the New Yorkers? Sprague spread his hands, and his big shoulders went up in a shrug. You have just as much incriminating evidence as I have. How does it strike you? The attorney shook his head in doubtful incredulity, again unconsciously following Editor Kendall's lead. It doesn't seem possible, he protested. Think of the tremendous consequence involved, outside of the crippling of the railroad. The short line wouldn't be the only sufferer in case of a dam break in the mesquite. The entire valley would be flood-swept, and our high-line dam— He stopped abruptly and half rose to his feet. Good Lord, Sprague, the breaking of the high-line dam would mean death and destruction without end. Sprague had found a cigar in an overlooked pocket, and was calmly lighting it. Though he did not tell Stillings so, the argument had finally gotten around into the field toward which he had been pushing it from the first. Three days ago, your high-line treasurer, Mr. J. Montague Smith, declared in the presence of witnesses, it was right here in this hotel lobby, and I happened to overhear it, that a ten-foot rise in the river, which, as you know, would submerge and sweep away miles of the railroad track in the canyon, would by no means endanger his dam. There you are, Mr. Stillings. Now fish or cut bait. Great Scott, what could Smith have been thinking of? ejaculated the lawyer. It was merely a bit of loyal brag, as he admitted to Starbuck and me on the train this afternoon, and it had been craftily provoked by one of the men who heard it. But he said it, and what is more, he said it to Jennings. This time the attorney's start carried him out of his chair and stood him upon his feet. I shall have to see Smith at once, he said hurriedly. Still, I can't believe that these New York stock pirates would authorize any such murderous thing as this. Authorize murder or violence? Of course not. Big business never does that. But what it does is to put a man into the field, telling him, in general terms, the end that is to be accomplished. The head pushers would turn blue under their fingernails if you'd charge them with murder. But that is what it would amount to, cold-blooded murder. Hold on a minute, objected Sprague. Let's apply a little scientific reasoning. Suppose this thing has been accurately figured out, engineering-wise. Suppose that, by careful computation, it has been found that a certain quantity of water, turned loose at the mouth of Mesquite Valley, would produce a flood of a certain height and full length of Timignani Canyon, say ten or twelve feet, sufficient to obliterate thirty-five or forty miles of the railroad track. Below its path of the greatest destruction, it comes out into your high-line reservoir lake, with some miles farther to go, and a greatly enlarged area over which to diffuse itself. Stillings was nodding intelligence. I'm beginning to see, he said. Ten feet in the canyon wouldn't necessarily mean ten feet at Smith's dam. No, but at the same time, Smith is on record as having said that ten feet wouldn't endanger his dam or the power plant. So there you are again. Stillings walked the length of the alcove twice, with his head down and his hands in his pocket, before he stopped in front of the expert to say, You've half convinced me, Mr. Sprague. If we could get the barest shred of evidence that these people are building a dam which isn't intended to hold. There spoke the lawyer again, laughed Sprague. If you had the evidence, what would you do? Institute legal proceedings at once. And how long would it take to get action? Well, that would depend upon the nature of the evidence I had to offer, of course. Sprague laughed again, derisively this time. Yes, I thought so while you were getting out your writs and monkeying around, do you know what that piece of canyon track cost, Mr. Stillings? I was told today that three million dollars wouldn't replace it, to say nothing of what it would mean to the railroad company to have its through line put out of business indefinitely. No, if we mean to... The interruption was the intrusion into the alcove of a huge-framed, hard-faced man who was fumbling in his pocket for a paper. Hello, Harding, said Stillings, and then jokingly, what brings the respected sheriff of Timignani County charging in upon us at this time of night? It's a warrant, said the sheriff, half an apology, and then to Sprague, I hate like the mischief to trouble you, Mr. Sprague, but duty's duty. Sprague smiled up at the big man. Tell us about it, Mr. Harding. You needn't bother to read the warrant. It's that scrap you had with Jennings up at the Mesquite this morning. He swore out a warrant against you for assault and battery. 
and are you going to lock me up overnight? I fancy that is what he would like to have you do. Not me, said the sheriff good-naturedly. I got Judge McFarland out of bed and made him come down to his office. I'm going to ask you to walk around there with me, just to let me out of it whole. I fixed it with the judge so you won't have to give bail. I'll go with you, Stillings offered. And a few minutes later, in the magistrate's office, the government man had bound himself, on his own recognizance, to appear in the court the next morning to answer the charge against him. On the sidewalk in front of the justice shop, Stillings reverted to the still more pressing matter. I'm going to see Smith before I sleep, if I have to drive out to the Baldwin Ranch to find him, he declared. In the meantime, Mr. Sprague, if you can devise any scheme by which we can get a legal hold of these fellows, anything that will serve as an excuse for our asking that an injunction be issued. That would come before Judge Watson, wouldn't it? Sprague broke in. Yes. See Kendall of the Tribune about that. From what he told me a couple of hours ago, I should say that your petition for an injunction would only be a crude loss of time. We'll try to think of a better way, or at least a more effective way. Good night, and don't omit to throw the gaff into Smith, good and hard. End of section 13, and end of part 1 of The Cloudbursters.